sometimes I imagine that I should have been born in Scotland because I keep thinking of the best laid plans of mice and men. Uh, I went back to my hotel today and uh, the electricity didn't work anymore and I had used up my battery power because I forgot to plug it in upstairs. So I wasn't able to review the material that I wanted to present today and we had a two hour lunch instead of what I thought was going to be a 45 minute lunch. So. Um, you get what you get. This is this is normal life for you. Maybe it's turned out to be normal life for me too. So I'm not worried if you're not worried. It's nice to see a lot of people I already know, so there won't be anything uh, terribly new. Even though what I'm going to present, the project that I'll present, is new, and there I've come across a new gateway to um, an educational approach that fits in very well with what I've been doing, but it goes a big step beyond. And I don't know if you will have this experience. In a way, I sort of wish it on you, those of you who are doing a PhD, and in a way, I sort of hope that you will be spared. And the situation is that you write a book and uh, use that book, talk about it, present it in different places for a couple of years, and then you come across a book that goes beyond what you wrote that had been written two years before. And you think to yourself, why didn't I come across that book? Why didn't I read that? Because then you would have started at a, on a different level than you actually did start on, and you'd be a lot further along, you imagine. But it's just the way of the world, too. It's, um, I guess Robert Burns just follows some people around, and I guess I'm one of those people. A um, couple of things that I've come across recently that you might want to look into if you're interested in social constructivist teaching and or that basic approach toward getting away from traditional transmissionist uh, teaching. One uh, individual is Brent Davis. Anybody know Brent Davis? A uh, gentleman who's, who does fantastic work in, uh, in educational policy studies, um, I believe at the University of Calgary in Canada. Uh, an absolutely phenomenal uh, educator. And he's written a fantastic book on teaching methods, outlining the different kinds of teaching methods that have been used throughout history. And it's absolutely crystal clear. And it includes a tremendous selection, beautifully presented in one relatively small book, 200, 250 pages, but um, extremely well done. His, the next book uh, goes into the topic that I'm just starting to work on now, that I could have known about in uh, 1996 when he and a group of other educational researchers started working on the idea of inaction. So inaction is this mm, alternative to uh, traditional Western civilization, it's a, it's a challenge to traditional we uh, Western uh, philosophy, rather, um, which has tended to make lots of subdivisions. And the most important one, perhaps, being the Cartesian distinction between the mind and the body. And since uh, Descartes' error, uh, since that book came out, and a number of similar ones, um, there's been a lot of discussion about how realistic that distinction is. And the idea of an action, which basically came, has come out of the work of Maturana and Varela, uh, two uh, ecological biologists in, from Latin America, from Colombia, if I remember right, it's Colombia, uh, but they've uh, worked outside of, the, of Latin America for a long time. Um, their approach has been picked up by educational researchers and by lots of people in different fields and applied to the philosophy of, philosophy of science, uh, philosophy of teaching, education in general, and so on. And I find it dovetails extremely well with what I've been proposing. Um, and sometimes, going along with what I said before, uh, best laid plans and so on, sometimes we don't pay attention to things that our mentors tell us. Um, in the year 1999, while I was finishing up my last book, I had Anthony read it for me. And of course, it came back with thousands of red suggestions. Extremely valuable, as you can imagine, all having received feedback from him. Um, and the one thing he said that I ignored was, he said, why are you going to call it a social constructivist approach? Do you, do you have to do that? Why don't you call it the Corrali approach? Um, maybe if I had pressed him on it and asked, why should I do that? And I really like this. I'm really attached to this. Maybe he would have told me, but I think, and I think if I had asked him, he would have said, things come and go. I don't know. Uh, approaches come and go. Um, they can be burdened by uh, prejudices, 
and so on. Um, there are lots of people who hear the word constructivism and the little hairs start to stand up on the back of their neck. Oh, God, not that again. We've heard so much about that. There's a gentleman right here who probably would say that. No? Chris, no? Okay. But there are plenty of people who are like that. So why do I have to put this label that I have borrowed anyway, interpreted uh, from people who have interpreted it again and again and again down the line since it was uh, uh, originally constructed and we can't even identify when the word social constructivism actually emerged. It's virtually impossible to trace back and find out who started using it. But why take that label and glue it onto your work and glue it to your name? It may be counterproductive because um, whenever I present the, the method, people, many people have, this, uh, have an idea prejudices, uh, preconceptions about what social constructivism is, and I have to tear all that apart if it doesn't correspond to what I've been doing. And if I look at what I do now in my classes, what I write about now, what I present in conferences, it's radically different from what I was doing six years ago. It's radically different. So is it still social constructivism? Is it the still, still the same thing? Can you just put a label on things and assume that they stay static, that re they remain that way? But how about the natural dynamism of thought and interaction with other people? The fact that I don't do this on my own, but I do it with my students day by day by day. And then I go and talk to people like you, and there have been hundreds of them over the past few years from around the world. You cannot help but be influenced by what other people say and think about what you're doing so that your practice becomes different from what you started out doing. Your principles become different. You reinterpret the theory you've read before, you understand it all differently than you originally did. So maybe that label is not too helpful. Maybe it would have been easier at this point when I'd like to move away from it if I didn't have it in the first place, social constructivism. Um, there are lots of articles. If you look on the web, you'll find hundreds and hundreds that try to debunk the whole idea of constructivism. What a useless concept. So if you've read a couple of those, you might think, why should I bother to even consider it? It's been uh, <clears throat> painted as a useless concept by enough people that it probably doesn't have any value for me in my classes, in my research, whatever it might be, wherever you might want to use this approach. So the, the labels sometimes squeeze everything in too tiny a package, I think. So I wish I had listened to, to Anthony back then, actually, uh, and hadn't just borrowed that label, because now it is moving far beyond that. What I have found, though, <clears throat> which is interesting from a historical perspective for me, is that by talking to you, and by you, <clears throat> I'm talking to the hundreds and hundreds of people that I've talked to in environments like this. In the first Tarragona uh, summer course, we had 70 to 75 participants, and I was talking to them about the same thing. And then they talked to me about their reactions in a large group, in small groups, individually at lunch, like we did today, in the evening, whatever it might be, by email after that, <clears throat> in individual contacts after that. So <clears throat> I found that my practice of social constructivism has moved away radically. And what I found is really interesting, it's moved in the direction of inaction. <clears throat> the idea of inaction is that we don't have, we are not, isolated individuals being acted upon in a classroom, nor are we isolated individuals uh, going about in context in the real world. We are part of the real world. That may sound absolutely trite to you, but uh, Western philosophy tends to make that distinction and similar dichotomies, t making us separate, making the mind separate from the body, the individual separate from society, uh, the individual separate from the environment in which he or she, she is located, and context becomes the place where we are. From an inaction perspective, you are the context. There is no difference between, for example, being, doing, and thinking. I can't go into the details here. I, I suppose I'm still working on it myself and will be for a long time. But if you're interested in that philosophical perspective, you might want to look into Varela and Maturana and other people like Davis who've who've been writing uh, in this vein. The implications are probably obvious to those of you who've been listening to the last few hours of discussions or participating in them here. Um, what happens if you are part of the environment 
You are not something, an agent that's being acted on or an agent that's simply acting like uh, an actor on a stage, having an impact on an audience or moving around against the backdrop of the scenery. You are part and parcel of everything that's going on. I'd like to show you what I mean by my own work with, with my students. It's not my work. It's never my work. It's our work, my students and mine, um, and how that's been moving in the direction of an action without me even realizing it because I wasn't really aware of it. I, have, I had, had not done the background reading. So my suggestion to you, those of you who are doing your PhD, is do your homework better than I did because you may find all kinds of wonderful things out there that will save you heartbreak later on or help you move to a different stage early on. It may, I may be wrong. It may be that I had to go this way, the school of hard knocks. And maybe it's fine that I've wound up where I am now in the year 2005, where um, if I had looked at some of these readings that were available in the mid-1990s, um, I might not have been in a position to do anything with that knowledge. So it may be a part of a fact that we are, by in being involved in activities, learning by doing, um, we progress in our thinking as well. And at some point, you're mature enough, your thinking has matured enough, that you can absorb new information that might have gone over your head earlier on. Another work that's very uh, valuable, and I see quoted very little, and then I didn't bother to read, was Hanno uh study on translator, translation competence. I just managed to read it. I'd heard about it. I glanced at it when it came out uh, in 1998. And um, I thought, no, I'm working on my own book, and this doesn't really go take me anywhere. And it was a big mistake, because I just read the, the book uh, recently, a couple of months ago. And I find it, again, it dovetails incredibly well with the approach that I've developed now, or where I am in my own approach, let's say. Perhaps not where I was in the year 2000 or 1998. Maybe then it was just over my head. And now I find myself thinking in ways that, that uh, where she was essentially in 1998 to some extent. Um, so that's something I'd certainly look at. Unfortunately, it's only in German. And she's written only one article, published one article that I know of uh, in English. It's extremely well written and it, in a very succinct way it does present her basic ideas. So uh, that's a very valuable reading to do, I think, Hanadi School. Um, I'd like to present a little project to you that we've done this semester and give you just a, an inkling of what I mean by having, by looking at the students and yourself as a teacher as being embedded, not set on a stage, but embedded in the context in which we are learning. And I use that word carefully, we are learning. It's not that the students are there learning something and we are teaching, we are all there learning. It was um, Rogers, the educational psychologist, I think, who said in the, the middle of the last century, the more I teach, the less interested I am in being a teacher and the more interested I am in being a learner. That's a, that's a, a quote that struck me years and years ago and I keep finding myself coming back to it, just like the quote from um, Socrates, you, you can't teach anything to anyone that's worth knowing. Things like that. Uh, and those things, if you're a social constructivist, they have to grab you and you have to hold on to them just by the very nature of, of that statement. You, know, you can't teach anything to anyone that's worth knowing. Well, what does that tell us about transmissionist teaching? Or if you happen to be a social constructivist one, you might latch onto those things and say, see, even Socrates was a social constructivist. Yay! So I'm in good company. I'd like to show you a bit of a project. Uh, you've heard it, the beginning of it, which is a little bit obnoxious, I find. But then we get into the film. Großmutter bin und auf meiner äh, Veranda sitze und einen Pullover strecke, möchte ich auf keinen Fall mal auf meine 20er zurückblicken und sagen, hätte ich nur. Hätte ich nur damals irgendwas beendet, was damals so schön angefangen hat. Und zwar nicht schön in dem Sinne, dass es ein, etwas Schönes war zu machen, sondern schön in dem Sinne, dass man sich intensiv mit etwas beschäftigt hat, was wirklich Sinn hatte. 
Und wenn es eine Sache gibt, die ich bisher in meinem Leben gemacht habe, die wirklich so erscheint, als hätte sie einen Sinn, dann ist es dieses Projekt. Es hat wirklich einen Sinn, weil, weil es, es irgendeinen Agenten braucht. Es kommt mir manchmal vor, als hätten diese Anstalten damals 1991 gesagt, als ich in diesen Hof reinlief, die nehmen wir. Irgendwie brauchen wir einen Agenten, die läuft gerade in unseren Hof rein. Wie wird es sein? Das haben wir uns nicht runtergerufen und gesagt, so, keine, jetzt mach mal. That's a good place to stop. Um, how many of you understand the, the German? Anybody? A few. Oh, good, good. Almost half. And you could really understand it quite well, what she was saying? Because, uh, well, I, you could probably tell me, but just to give you a hint for those who don't know any German, she speaks very quickly. It sounds very much like stream of consciousness because she has not planned out what she's going to say um, in the sense of having written a script. She's talking directly to someone who's interviewing her. You can't hear the interviewer. Um, and she does this for 90 minutes. This is the whole movie, essentially, with, uh, interspersed with lots of pictures of um, uh, a building that she's working on as an artist. But the language here um, is essentially hers, right? And it's the same kind of mm, rather spontaneous speech full of false starts, normal speech essentially what we always do when we're not carefully prepared, when we're not reading from a script, when most, at least for most of us. Um, and the project here that was offered to my students and to me was to subtitle this film. Anthony's thinking something already. Because uh, we talked a little bit about subtitling yesterday. That is, you told me, some of you told me about your module in the masters, I think, right? Subtitling module? They've forgotten since yes or no. But, uh, oh, they, they're not here. Oh, okay. Um, but anyway, I believe it's in the masters that you have a, a short model, module and introduction to, to subtitling. And uh, having the approach that I have, basically you can probably, some of you can already imagine uh, what I would not have done. But, uh, and I knew already what I would not do, but I didn't really know what I would do. One of the things <clears throat> that I could not do was to be the expert in the classroom with respect to subtitling or the topic of the film because I had ne have never subtitled anything in my life. I've never taken a course on subtitling. I've never read an article or had never read an article on it. Uh, I'd never worked with this subtitle workshop program or any other one ever. Um, but having done projects with my students now for close to 20 years, I knew that we would manage somehow. So the main um, responsibility that I felt that I had was to take the potential job to my students and say, can we handle it or not? Telling them up front, I don't have the expertise to teach you how to subtitle. Of course, I'd like to know how to subtitle myself. I mean, why not? It could be an interesting thing to do. I, I'd certainly be interested in, the, in that. Um, so can we handle it? Look at the language. Consider that you're going, going to be uh, doing the subtitles, translating into your foreign language. So these would be seventh semester students translating from German in, into English. The job was proposed to us by uh, the Gali Film Company, which is a small uh, family-owned ent enterprise in Wiesbaden, um, and they produce films, primarily documentaries. This is a documentary as well. And uh, this particular one was a sort of pet project um, created by the owners, the, the man and wife um, in, uh, who own this company. And they had no funding for it and could not give us any money to do our, our work. So it would have been purely a learning opportunity for us. And I say us again uh, carefully meaning that I would be learning at least as much, I, I would guess in many cases more uh, than the students. That, that was my expectation at the beginning. Turned out very differently from what we expected. As most of these projects do, if you're working with the real world, things just happen. You know, it's Murphy is out there lurking behind every door. If you close the door to your classroom, you are awfully safe. 
And I wonder if that's not why we do that very often. As I mentioned in class today, we close the door because we're safe. We're up there. We're in control. We've got our text. We've got our lesson plan. And we can feed it to the students. We know what's going to happen. This came out in the discussion a number of times today, um, that um, if, if you uh, expose yourself, if you set your papers aside, things are going to happen that, you're, that are unexpected. And you're going to have to deal with them. Basically, those who mentioned it, including myself, were of the mind that that's a healthy thing for us. And it's part of our own lifelong learning process of opening ourselves up to these new challenges rather than saying, oh, God, I'm terrified of what might happen if somebody asks me a question I cannot answer. Um, <clears throat> so I took the project to the students um, last semester in the spring semester. And um, I gave them, had the, them look at the film a part of it, a good half of it, and consider whether they'd like to do it or not. And they said, well, we'd like to know a little bit about subtitling first. And I said, well, what do you want to do? How are we going to do it? I don't know how to subtitle at all. And they said, well, could you find somebody who knows something about it in the student body and get them to tutor us a little bit in how to use the software, see what subtitling is all about? So I found somebody like that. There are plenty of students who come to Spain. I believe the course is, there's, there's one in uh, Salamanca every summer. Uh, or there has been for several summers. I don't know if any of you have done that. The subtitling course, apparently an excellent one. But there are a number of students in Gamosheim who've taken that course. And I found a young woman who was willing to give us an introduction to subtitling. So she did it in a very transmissionist sort of way. She presented some of the so, rules, if you like, even though there are no rules as such, there are guidelines for, su for subtitling. Uh, some of the norms <coughs> of subtitling in the UK uh, the United States and Germany, uh, because we're dealing with a situation that's unusual for this company. Their films are produced in Germany. They have nothing to do with subtitling, but they have, certainly have nothing to do with uh, the American market. Any films that they produce that are subtitled by someone else are just destined for the, the UK market. So um, <clears throat> she presented some ideas about it. It was a very conventional class, very little interaction on the part of the students. They didn't ask questions. They didn't really say much of anything. They, they did what she told her to do. She said, OK, if you want to start your movie or if you want to load your subtitles, go to File, Load Subtitles, right, which we did <coughs> on the second, the second session or whatever it might be. And if you want to e uh, enter a subtitle, you, you click on a field here and press uh, Einfügen, Enter, and you can enter a new subtitle. And then you can type in down here what you want to subtitle. And then she told us about the constraints, about putting an ellipsis at the beginning of the end and the end, which turned out to be a convention in Germany, but not in, the great, in great Britain, or not necessarily anyway. Um, so we ended, we've ended up changing these subtitles that you see here. So if anyone here is a subtitle, don't worry, because these are not the, ver the final ones. Um, and we tried it out for that one day. The, the teacher was very disappointed, because there didn't seem to be any real interest on the part of the students. Whereas the students told me, yeah, yeah, we'd like to do that. Uh, in typical student fashion, well, it's better than translating an old Corrali text that he picks out of the newspaper. Not that I really do that, but you can imagine uh, this is a little bit more fun probably than translating a newspaper text, which turns out to be, at least in the surveys, informal surveys I've done, 95 to 99% of texts that are translated in Gamasan, um, newspaper text and magazine text. Whereas in the market, uh, at least in the German market, Newspaper texts represent a tiny portion of texts that are translated. It may be different in different countries, but there's a, an incredible discrepancy there. But students see the value of doing other things anyway. So at the beginning of the fall semester, I brought in the film, and I had asked the students, well, how are we going to set it up so that you get some instruction? Do you want some instruction, or do you want to figure out how to do this on their own? And together, they came up with a syllabus, as I suggested in my book for the Popodotkum, the Introduction to Translation Studies, develop a syllabus with them. What kinds of things are you going to need to learn? For example, if you're, let's uh, start it here. When I'm in my big mother, I'm on my veranda sitze on the pullover strecke. So you don't see it anymore. That's too bad. Uh, on this particular one, when I'm a grandma sitting, I'm knitting on my porch, and she actually says a lot more than that. And they don't know anything about subtitling. Let's just hear it one more time. Okay. 
wenn ich irgendwann mal Großmutter bin und auf meiner äh, Veranda sitze und einen Pullover strecke. So, if, if at some point in my life, you know, I'm sitting on my porch and knitting and thinking back, right? I don't want to look back and say, if I had only, is what she says next. But here, she, they've got to turn that into, when I'm a grandma knitting on my porch, or something else that fits into the little bit of space that we have. So these students who know nothing about subtitling, and this teacher who knows nothing about subtitling, are sort of at a loss. What are we going to do? How are we going to learn how to do those things? So we, uh, we uh, hired a tutor um, to teach us for about three hours. I believe it was three hours, so two full classes. Um, and we asked her to give us some of the norms of subtitling when it comes to the length of text, size of the script, um, what do you do with punctuation, can you use ellipses or not, can you put commas at the end of your uh, segments, um, to what extent do you have to worry about uh, lip synchronization or synchronization at all between what's on the screen, uh, between the, the film and the text, because we had no idea at all. So we had someone come in and do that. And at that point, the students had agreed to do the project. So all of a sudden, at the beginning of the winter semester, the beginning of November, end of October, there was an incredible amount of energy, all of a sudden, because they had committed themselves to the project. The semester before, it was at the end of the semester, it was a, well, take a look at this and see if you'd like to do it next semester kind of offer. Very little energy, very little interest in doing anything, apparently. In the fall, of course, we had different students. These are all optional classes, these translation classes that we offer. So I didn't have many of the same students anyway. They had to agree again to do the project, but they were interested, and we decided to tackle it. So we came up with certain things. For example, 34, just to give you some examples of what our tutor told us, 34 characters per subtitle, subtitle, uh, subtitling line uh, would be pretty normal. You c there's some variability, 34 to 36. So we could work with that while we were creating our subtitles. Um, ellipses, put them at the beginning and at the end. Of course, this is of someone who was uh, German, <coughs> who had done a subtitling course working into German. So she was telling us about the norms and conventions of German subtitling, not conventions that would be appropriate in, the great, in great Britain or in the United States necessarily. Did we ask about that? No. Um, Best laid plans of mine, mine and men, uh, mice and men. Um, let's see, what else? To what extent do the, does the structure of the subtitle have to fit in with the structure of the original? We never would have thought of that. But our subtitling tutor told us that if there is transparency in some of the words that the German person says, for, uh, let's see if I have any examples here. Um, Just one example would be great. This is project, she says at this point. Okay, because she says project, and there's transparency there for the English speaker. Even if you know no German, <coughs> you hear the word project, or you might hear it, and you might recognize project, especially if you see project on the screen at the end of the sentence when she finishes speaking. So according to our subtitling uh, guide, that was an essential thing to do, to look for transparent words at appropriate key places in the subtitles and make sure that we reproduce them. So she gave us a long list of, I don't remember how many constraints, things that we should watch out for. <clears throat> As it turned out, these were not things that we could just take and apply and be happy with. Thinking of the course that we saw yesterday, where you've got a book, a beautifully written book on how to edit and revise, so the students can learn all those rules and go and apply them. By the end of the course, they're going to be able to do that. But in the real world, things don't work out the way, the way they do in textbooks, unfortunately, as we found out in this project. And I didn't find that to be a bad thing at all. It seemed to be the way the world works. You know, Murphy is out there, and, and Robert Burns is right. <clears throat> and if you get used to that, as a student, you're going to be better prepared for it when you're out there in the real world, I think. So we, we started working on our um, subtitles after th two days of instruction. It may have been three days. I can't remember. Um, so we divided up the subtitles. This, I always agree with the students. How are we going to do this? They, um, in, in pairs, they took chunks of the text. We had the text printed out, the dialogue printed out, essentially monologue. Um, and they took tracks, a certain amount of text to do in, in a, a week on their own at home. 
And then they agreed to come back to class. They bring notebook computers, their own notebook computers, and compare and contrast, revise their own work with my help and that of the tutor who remained in the class to help out for a few weeks. So, um, so we began our work. We got through about halfway. And at that point, I got an email message from the organizers of the project, the, the man who made the film and his wife. And uh, <clears throat> he said, and it was just a reiteration of the constraints. The constraints were, there were about three. They wanted a certain size type face. They wanted a particular or type, a certain type face. And they wanted a certain number of characters. So the second time around, this is just six weeks after the first time, when we started doing our subtitles, 34 characters per line, he said, we need them to be 26 characters per line. We've changed our minds. In the real world, this happens. In a closed environment of the classroom where the teacher is in control, it doesn't happen. It's the tightrope, tightrope again, that I mentioned this morning. If the tightrope is lying on the floor, it doesn't matter if you fall off. You just laugh and get back on it. If it's up five meters up in the air and you fall off, you're in trouble. Right? So here, we could have been in trouble. We could have said, well, you told us 34, so we're dumping the job, and we could have caused lots and lots of bad feelings at, at the very least. If we were being paid for it, we perhaps could have been sued for not fulfilling our part of the contract. Or we could have sued him for trying to dump some new constraint on us. Because as you can imagine, and certainly anyone who's done subtitling knows, if I tell you 34 and you do half the film that way, and I come back and say, no, it's 26, it's not a matter of cutting little bits and pieces here and there. It's starting over again. Because you need coherence. You recreate a text. If I take out all the subtitles and give it to you, that, that is a text. It's a coherent, cohesive text, whether they're 26 characters in length or 34 or 37. So we just had to deal with it. We started over again, went back to the beginning. Probably a good learning experience. And fortunately, German student, students being as stoic as they are, they just took it all in stride. And they said, OK, we'll start over again. No problem at all. And they did. And I'm sure they learned a great deal. Because if you imagine also translating from translating su or subtitling from German into English, and English is your foreign language, you learn a tremendous amount with respect to how to get the gist out of language. This woman's speech is extremely redundant. It's full of false starts. It's full of expressions that are barely idiomatic because she's speaking off the top of her head. Um, the collocations do not fit many, many times. Even though she's uh, an educated speaker of the language, she's a normal, natural speaker of it, too. And all of that is in the film. So they are able to, they're forced to weed out all of the trash in her speech. And they had to do it twice for half of the film. So we weeded it down to 26 characters per line. And then at that point, we had a, a professional subtitler come in, someone who graduated from our program a few years before and who simply subtitles for a living. And she told us about her, um, her work. And she came in and made us see things that would have, should have been absolutely apparent to anyone, you would think, after the fact. One of the things was, look, listen to this woman speak, and when she stops and starts with respect to when the subtitle appears on the screen and when it disappears. Tell me if these match up for you. So you don't have to know any German for that. It has to do with sound and uh, when the subtitles appear. Because that's one of the constraints we learned is really important, that, you have, that it be simultaneous when the subtitle appears, at least. Now, let's see. Did you see that last one? Not this one, but this one where it was completely off. Did you notice that one? I think it was, was it, uh, no? Or was it? 
so erscheinen, als hätte sie einen Sinn, dann ist das dieses Projekt. Das hat wirklich einen Sinn, weil... Right there. Weil es, es She's still talking. Um, wait a minute. No, I think that was all right, wasn't it? Und wenn es eine Sache gibt, die ich bisher in meinem Leben gemacht habe, die wirklich so erscheint, als hätte sie einen Sinn, dann ist es dieses Projekt. Das hat wirklich einen Sinn, weil... There. Weil She had already started saying this before it appears on the screen. And the, the effect, which you, you, I assume you would agree, is disturbing for the reader, uh, reader and or viewer, uh, especially if you understand the German, uh, because you're, you're trying to concentrate on two messages at the same time, or the same message with a décalage in between. So they're not starting and stop, stopping at the same moment, and it's very tiring for the viewer to do that. Um, we had heard this constraint before, but we hadn't paid any attention at all. So when our subtitling professional came in, she pointed out that we were uh, several milliseconds off for every single subtitle, and we had not even noticed it. We thought that our subtitles were exactly, started exactly at the right moment and stopped at exactly at the right moment. And she just told us in a blanket sense, she says, they're all off. And we said, wait a minute, let's go back and look. We went back, and sure enough, she said, listen, and look, right there, right there, right there. Every single subtitle was wrong, which was pretty fascinating. Because we had the constraint in advance, we had the rule, we knew how to apply it, we knew how to make the adjustment in the software, and we simply had not done it. Our tutor had told us certain things, she told us about that, we hadn't applied it. But when our professional came in, who had no vested interest in what we were doing, and she told us, no, I couldn't get away with that as a professional. That was suddenly a new challenge for all of us. Okay, we're going to go back and work on timing. Timing is an essential part of the subtitling process, and we can see that it's disturbing. Before, we didn't even notice it because we were too involved in appreciating our wonderful subtitles to even consider whether that was disturbing or not to have them start and stop at the wrong moment. This is part of the inaction process where people coming into the classroom are contributing things who are not necessarily the normal teachers in the situation. The students are learning from casual events that occur and the, the students are teaching the student. Uh, uh, the students are teaching the teachers as well. So the tutors, in every case, were students of mine in other classes, and the one woman was a student of mine before. Um, and they, the, so the roles were turned. And then I found that I was learning from students all the time, um, as young people are today so much more familiar with computers than we were, uh, even you know, ten years later, and ten, uh, when we were ten years older than them. I started using the computer at the age of about 29. And my students have been using computers since they were little kids. Um, so they learn the technological side of doing subtitling in no time. It was sort of like second nature. They know how to play around with programs. I don't have to spend 90% of the class, as was indicated for the class that some of the 90% of the time, telling them about the technical details of how to enter subtitles, because they're going to pick it up on their own anyway virtually instantly, and every single student did, in no time. Within an hour, they were able to handle all the, the features of the program that they needed from the beginning of the course to the end. So we could spend 95% of our time working on the linguistic side and actually creating subtitles and then perfecting our work. I, we don't have much time. I've already used up much more than my 30 minutes. So let me just tell you something else about the inaction process as the, pro as the project went on. We, we had agreed to hand in the project at the end of the semester, and the, uh, the uh, client had told us that <clears throat> we could simply hand in our subtitles in um, sub -alpha, substation alpha format, one of the formats that's very common in subtitling, apparently, and that this program can produce. Two weeks before the end of the semester, we uh, get a message, um, Sorry to tell you this, but we're unable to import your subtitles. So I had sent them the first half of the film when we had redone them to reduce them to 26 uh, characters per line and so that he could give it a try. And he, re he realized at that point, he told us that we can't import your subtitles. So what are we going to do? In two weeks, the whole thing is supposed to be done. We had spent 13 weeks working on our subtitles. We were involved in the project. It was had become our baby. We were, you know infatuated with our own work, this incredible product that we were helping to create uh, or make available to an English-speaking audience, because it's an amazing project that she's, she did. She um, 
turned an asylum into a musical work of art with a Mozart coming out of all of the windows of an enormous decrepit asylum. And she did it all essentially on her own. So we were really involved with it. And so the options were dump the whole thing, say, too bad. That's your problem. An action wouldn't have allowed us to do that. And an activist situation where you're embedded in the context doesn't allow you to simply withdraw from it because there's nowhere to go. You can abdicate and then just go sit in a corner and cry. Right. And neither I nor my students allow ourselves to do that. This is going far beyond anything that social constructivists would suggest. What do you do when a challenge is given to you at close to the deadline that seems insurmountable? So I said to the students, what are you going to do? What are we going to do? What do you do? Is there something you want me to do? They could have said, well, OK, why don't you go up to the company and type in our subtitles and I'll be OK. You can imagine I would have said gulp. OK, so but their obvious solution was for them to go in teams to the company in Wiesbaden, which is about 120 kilometers from Gammersheim, take the train up there and alternate entering this. That is one team per day, alternating, entering the subtitles. And we estimated it would take us about three days to enter all the subtitles by hand into their equipment. Of course, we had never seen their equipment. We knew it had nothing to do with what we were using based on a Macintosh system. And as it turned out, they didn't have any subtitling equipment at all, which they had never told us. They had never done created a subtitle in their lives, which they never told us. They allowed us to believe this for 13 weeks. As it turned out, all they used the software for is to create films. And there happens to be a feature in there that has a little button at the top up here somewhere saying create subtitle. But you don't create them like this. You key in each character and it becomes a graphic. And you have to place each one, each character on the screen separately. It's not a lovely little split window like in this program. Not a subtitling program at all. So we had, imagine, 12 students going up in teams of three to this company for three days. And each team had to be introduced to the software and the hardware, learn how to use that equipment, and then enter the subtitles, a certain number, by the end of the day. And the next team had to come and take up where they left off. And of course, they wanted to know something about the filmmaking industry, about the subtitling industry, because they assumed, as we all assumed, that this company knew something about it, um, and find out more about what they might be able to do in the way of uh, media translation. So the company was thrilled to have the people, the students come. The students were very willing to go. Um, they didn't even ask about having expenses covered or anything. In the end, the company offered to pay them. I offered to pay them first, and the company was too embarrassed by that. So they agreed to pay the travel expenses for all the students. As it turned out, it took six days, not three days. So students had to drop everything they were doing and go from 8 o'clock in the morning until 9 o'clock at night, including traveling, from Gammasheim to Wiesbaden, and drop everything else they had to do at home. And every student did it, did it willingly because it was their project. They were embedded in the middle of it. This was not a task that Corrali came up with. It was once I offered it to them and they said, it's ours. And they worked on it for hours and hours and hours and hours. It became their project. And there was no way out. They were, there was no way for them to say, no, I'm not going to do this. We are going to see it through to the end. Um, the film is ready for publication. They finished it themselves in six days, not in three. Um, and interesting things came out of it that I haven't been able to analyze completely yet. But one of the most interesting things that I noticed or heard in one of the feedback statements, and I'm going to sort of close with this, is that one of the students who was there in a team said he went out to get coffee, came back, and he heard or sat in while his fellow student taught the man who owns the company how to create subtitles in his software. And and he just sat there sort of astounded listening because he assumed that the man knew how to do it. My student had figured out how to do it. You know, when he introduced her to it, not really knowing himself, the students had worked together to do it and then were teaching the owner of the company how to create subtitles, which we figured he knew how to do from the very beginning. So in the end, if you think about what was done over that 15 week course, not only 
learning a little bit about how to do subtitles, participating in a project where things go wrong. That's a real life project, not just because it's fun or you have your name on it, but because things are, because surprises happen, because you are responsible for what you do, because you have your name on it, and all of those other things, but also because learning is not seen as a one-way street. So when you go out into the real world, you may find yourself teaching someone who you were expecting to learn from. So if we send our students out, let them open the door to our hermetically sealed classroom, let them go out there, they may come into contact with other people and may not just be the passive recipients of knowledge from those people, they may end up teaching those people too. And that's an action where the individual is learning and teaching at the same time, thinking, being, and doing all at the same time. And these are the things I've been doing since I started developing this approach, but more and more in that direction of making sure that students are so embedded in whatever project they decide to do that there is no escape. They can't just sit, sit at home for two weeks and say, I didn't feel like coming. They're absolutely obligated because they are embedded in the situation to continue working and see it through to the end and to do their best work. And the value of that seems to be enormous compared to any value that um, could be achieved through me teaching them all the details that, of a particular field that I think they should know. Because they not only will have learned those things, they learned how to create subtitles, believe me. I didn't teach them anything about it, but I know a lot about it now, too, along with them. Um, <clears throat> but they know how to deal with problems when they arise, and that they know that they're capable of doing it. But the time someone tells them, oh, sorry, the deadline's been moved up three days, or no, we didn't mean that constraint, we meant this constraint, all the kinds of things that we, you and I deal with regularly in translation work, um, they're going to be a little bit better prepared for it, thanks to the, this class. I've talked much too long. So I'm going to stop.